everybody? Can y'all hear me? Okay, there you go. Okay. Well, welcome to the second day of Lightning Talks. Lightning Talks, there are five-minute short presentations. Each of them will be timed. Um, upon the last one minute, I'll give you a signal to wrap it up. Um, there will be two podiums, current speaker, and then the next one up. And then once the current present presenter is finished, I'll come and announce the next one and then announce the following one to come here and prepare just to keep it smooth. Okay, so um, the first one on the list is Nicholas. Is that right? Okay. That, yeah, that's fine. And then the next one, Tim. So you can come up to the second podium. All right. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm sorry, originally Nico was supposed to do this presentation, and he told me about 15 minutes ago that he couldn't make it, so I'm going to wing this completely. Um, I'm going to talk about Swagger, which is a, a library slash framework -y thing that allows you to document REST APIs. Um, it's, it solves a really neat problem where everybody has REST APIs now, but everybody does REST in their own kind of way, and you end up with trying to figure out how somebody implemented a certain thing and it all gets very, like you, you're struggling on the command line or you, you're trying to do stuff in your browser and it just doesn't work very well. Um, what Swagger does, it allows you to document your REST API in a very precise manner. Um, you can pretty much document anything from what the endpoint is, what the parameters are, I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then it gives you this, this live uh, environment. It allows you to go in, um, actually talk to the API from a, from a UI in your browser. It shows you what's going on. It shows you um, what stuff is being sent, what's being returned, and it's all very easy, and it's, uh, it's a breeze to work with. Um, I'm, I'm from the OEE project. We use this in, in our project, um, and it's been really great at trying and at bringing in people and exposing them to our API and showing them what you can do with it. Um, and it's been, I think it's been one of those things that have been really, have been really successful in, in exposing people to our APIs. Um, I'll quickly show you what it looks like to document something in Node. Um, so what we've done, we, we've, we document all our REST APIs in, uh, in JS doc, in, in JavaScript comments. Um, and as you can see, it's super detailed. So we can tell you that an API is a post um, method. It runs on a certain endpoint on slash content slash create. And it has all these parameters, which it, it tells you what the type of a parameter is, um, whether you need one or more, um, what the potential values could be, um, what, what the result will be. You will get, so you will get a basic content item back um, you get uh, all the response codes from your APIs, but, and the, there's a little bit of explanation about what's going on, uh, and that explains it in a human way. Um, and it's just very easy to document this. You write this once, and it's there. Um, there, is, there are libraries out there which you can, you, can write your, you can write how your API should look like, and then it generates the API for you. Um, we were a little bit late in the process to start using those. Uh, libraries, but that's definitely possible. If you're using Java and you're using JAXRS, um, it's a matter of adding a couple of annotations to your to your code, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, and all of that gives you it gives you a lot of things. Uh, first of all, it, it will it will spit out um, this JSON on your API, so people can, if they were interested in doing this, they could look at this and they could start writing tooling around this. 
And that's what Swagger has done as well. So you could Swagger allows you to generate uh, client libraries from your APIs. So you can generate, so, so since we have a uh, Swagger compliant API, we can generate Ruby clients, uh, Java, Node, basically any language you want. We can generate a client for it and it can interact with our API. And it will have reasonable names, so there will be a, like a post content create collab doc uh, function in there that you can use, and it will talk to our API, and you don't have to fuss around with fi trying to figure out how it works. It just works. And that's one thing. But another thing is the, oh, let me refresh. <laughs> or maybe I shouldn't have refreshed. Okay, so one thing it, it generates is this Swagger UI, and this lists all our, all our endpoints. Um, it lists all our operations, all the things you can do. So you can see, um, for example, me. Me shows you information about the current authenticated user. So if I try this out, it shows me, it will, obviously it will, will, turn, it will return JSON. And so it shows me, it gives me this blob. And I can see that I've, um, that me, Simon Kerwink, is, is authenticated. Um, and it shows me the, if it returns a 200, that's okay. If it returns a 401, you probably need to authenticate. Um, and that's, that's a nice thing, but you can also do more advanced stuff, like for example, okay. Uh, <laughs> is it one minute or am I done? Okay, well, <laughs> oh, I didn't notice. Sit there. No. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm Tim Levitt. I'm from uh, UW Madison, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about microservices. And Let me get uh, Leonardo, though, to come up yes. to the next page. All right. So for uPortal right now, we have a concept of one JVM to rule them all. Um, so you have the uPortal instance, and then you have a bunch of portlets that all talk to it via a shared library. Um, this is great. It's very helpful for certain instances, but it has problems with scalability. Um, our JVM right now is three gigs, and when we want to add another one, we have to add a, throw a whole other three gig thing, when really only what's happening at the beginning of classes is there's only a few portlets that are getting hit very heavily, but it's causing problems across the whole JVM. So I had an idea, and I thought I'd just throw it out there and see what happened. Um, of microservices. This is a pretty new thing, but a lot of people are starting to do it, especially with cloud solutions, and I figured why not make a manager that managed a bunch of cloud solution uh, instances. So my thought is, is maybe split up, instead of having portlets have apps that are more split up, more independent, that you can run in Docker instances. Um, so the Docker instances would run a Tomcat container, and then that inside of that Tomcat container you could have one or more apps. This is, makes it easier to split out your heavily utilized applications um, instead of having it all in one. This would all be managed by a, con or a container manager um, that obviously we would have to write, but it could be something a lot like what uPortal is today. And if you think about it conceptually, this is a lot like portlets in Portal. Um, so I, I did a little bit of research, and I found a Spring Cloud Netflix. Um, I encourage you to check out the Spring Cloud and Spring Cloud Netflix, and they're already doing this today using Amazon Web Services. Um, so what they do is they build all these little containers or little apps that communicate with each other and automatically do load balancing when they see a huge spike with certain components. Um, so the general idea, it's kind of a bold idea, um, but what if portlets became a standard web application that was completely independent? What if the portal container was an app container manager that you could bring up and down Docker containers or instances um, or specific applications where you needed to be? And this could even be automated. Um, and instead of having an XSLT front end, it had an AngularJS app front end that was independent and you could load balance out as well. It helps out with um, when you have issues with specific points of your application, instead of just creating another node that's pretty big, you could just create little pieces. So 
That was really quick. But um, in summary, just having some new applications, or a lot, of some, a lot of new applications are being written this way. And I think there's a lot of benefit in jumping on the bandwagon and seeing what's going on. Um, and I'm curious about what you guys think of this approach. I know it's pretty radical and different and scary, but that's all I got. Um, there's some links that on here, and I also linked in the slides. Uh, go check out docker.com and uh, the Spring Cloud Netflix. So that's it. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so next is Leonardo, and then up to the podium is Matthew Bucket. Great. up and having some little technical difficulties. So my name is Leonardo Canessa. I work at the University of Dayton and I made some additions to the roster tool. These additions were created as the roster tool is um, highly used by our faculty. We really like it as well. And we made these additions to improve the value of the roster tool. We wanted to bring more information to the roster tool in, from student engagement as well as demographics. We also did some minor stylizing as well. Now, before the roster tool, hold up one second. Now, before, this is what the roster tool would look like. Uh, this is not as good as I would hope is it to look, but you can see sort of there's an email address, and you see the currently showing participants and whatnot, but it's not as clean as it could have been. So what I ended up doing is uh, we changed the styling of the roster tool and we created uh, a number of new views. Now, if you give me one moment, I'll try and show you these views. So what we did, we added a student activity service, which kept track of when a student visited the site and displayed uh, their last visited time, as well as the total number of visits. We also, uh, more importantly, added a statistics page. And on this page, we showed the demographic information from the class, the number of freshmen, the number of seniors, what their majors were, the advisors that were of those students. This allows faculty to easily be able to see the who was a freshman, which might, the freshmen might need more help as they're new to the university experience as well. And I will try and show you this page. So this is what the demographics page would look like. I use the Google Charts API to create a nice little graph of all the information showing the academic standing and all the majors. 
when you mouse over these objects, you are, see the exact count, so you can get exact numbers that are used as well. Uh, the standing is listed over here, as well as uh, their majors and advisors is over to the uh, right of that. Now, um, the only other thing, these changes are available. On, I did put them on our GitHub if you're interested to see that, which is located there. It's just a drop of our 2.9 version of roster. I'm a little disappointed that this presentation didn't go as well as I like, but that is life. And that will be all. all right. <laughs> Okay, next is Matthew Bucket and then Christopher Shower. Is that right? Okay, you're next. Thanks. Okay, hi, I'm Matthew Bucket from Oxford, and I was just going to give you a quick talk about Docker. Was that already had it mentioned in a lightning talk, and I just thought I'd give you a quick summary. So, ooh, ooh. do I have navigation? Do I have navigation? No. Okay. Yay, that's better. Okay, so Docker is all about containers. You may have heard about Docker before, and what Docker is, it's a bit like a virtual machine, but it's not a virtual machine. Docker is about isolating things into um, a process. So you typically you'll take something that you'd normally run on your laptop or your machine, your virtual machine up in Amazon or on your local deployment, um, and put it inside a Docker container. And so this is all about, so it thinks it's all on its own, that there's nothing else out there in the world. It's running in its own little magical micro world. Um, and when it's living in its magical micro world, it wants to think it's alone, but also it wants to have a little file system. So it has all of its nice little files, so it can read the C library and it can read some fonts off disk. And so that gets, gets passed around with the Docker container. And it's all in one place. And in Docker, this is often called an image. So this is the file system that will allow your process to run. Now, it's all very well having a process running, but it's not very good if it can't talk to anything else. So Docker gives your process its own little private network that's the same everywhere it's run. And this private network is its personal network, but it allows you to say, I've got this little bit that this process wants to talk on. So it might be the web server port, or it might be the database port. And you can just say, make it keep itself on its own, but just expose a little bit so other people can talk to it. And, but it's a very cut down version of what you'd normally expose. Um, this thing called Docker is built on existing technologies that have sort of been around a reasonable amount of time. And it's um, just sort of a layer on top of them is the best way to think of it. So it's a way of using the existing technologies that are in something like Linux and putting a, wrapping them all up in one nice parcel so you don't have to understand them as individual components. Um, but why might we want to use this thing? So it's got this magical thing called Docker. Why might we want to use it? Um, for development, for deployment, it basically allows you to take something that you'd normally have a long install script for and give it to somebody and just say, just start it up, it'll all just work. Because it's got everything it needs there in this one big package, and it makes it very easy for, say, a new developer to just start up a Docker container. They've got the file system there, um, they've got a network there, and the process just starts up. The copy of Tomcat just starts up, or the copy of Node, and you don't have the problem of, oh, this isn't quite right in this setup, or this isn't quite right. And one of the brilliant things is that you can take the same, exactly the same thing, maybe with some configuration changes, but deploy it on your local box or deploy it to AWS. You don't have to repackage anything to deploy in a different environment. Um, but what's wrong? Okay, so it all sounds sort of nice-ish, but we've had a, a few issues. So one thing is it, it's quite new. Um, it, it, it could be the thing that 
becomes popular, but Docker at the moment is one of the new kids on the block, and it might be the sort of go the way of Mercurial. Um, and there might be this other great big thing that comes out and beats it to death, a bit like Git came along. Um, and also it doesn't deal, okay, so I work on the Sakai project, and Docker doesn't deal very well when you've got a huge great big blob that you want to go and deploy. So a copy of Sakai is sort of half a gig, and it's not really optimized for that sort of setup. So there are some sort of teething troubles, there are some workarounds, but that's the sort of pain points that you hit. So should you use it? Well, we're now using it in production, so Sakai at Oxford is all running on Docker. This is, I'm just talking about the Tomcat process here, not all the other bits, all the database, but we use it for production and we use it in development as well. But in development, we do Dockerize everything. So we Dockerize MySQL, we Dockerize a copy of Solar, we Dockerize Apache, and it means that our developers can very easily check out our Docker files, type Docker Compose up, and it should, as long as they've installed Docker, just go and work without any problems. No more copy this file here. Okay, and I think that's the end. Next person. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, next is Christopher Schauer. Is there a Louisa Lee? Okay, you'll be next. Hi, I'd like to talk today about a tool that I found really useful in day-to-day -day development. Uh, before I get into it, I'd like to bring you through a hypothetical scenario. So say you're a Sakai developer for your institution and you're midway through an upgrade to Sakai 10. Uh, everything's going along nicely, Sakai 2.9 is in the past and you come in one day and there's an email about this critical bug that has to be fixed in 2.9. So you go back, check out your 2.9 branch, go spin up a build, it's gonna take 15 minutes, so you head out to the break room, make your coffee, you know, maybe chat with a coworker, see how their day's going, and you come back to your desk and you see this. Nope, you don't see that, you see this. <laughs> so, build failure. So you're like, oh, I don't remember seeing that last time I built 2.9, hmm, that's kind of strange. So you go through, maybe debug it a little bit, and spend five minutes, and then it dawns on you. 2.9 runs Java 6, 10 is Java 7. So you're like, okay, go in here, you know, export Java home to Java 6, run the build again. Wait another 15 minutes, another build failure. Oh, what did I do this time? Oh, turns out that 2.9 uses Maven 2, and 10 uses Maven 3. Well, there is this tool, which I don't know why the website isn't really showing up, but it's called DIRENV, I believe that's the pronunciation, and it's, a, it's an environment variable manager, and it lets you set environment variables based on your current directory as well as the parent directory. So I'll just do a quick demo here. So we have a folder here. We've got some Java 6 project, a Java 7 project, and a Java 8 project. So right now if I do Maven version, you can see my standard Maven version is 3.2.5 with Java 1.7. So if I go into this Java 6 project, which I've already configured to work with this Durian V, and you can now see that running Maven 2.2.1 with Java version 1.6. So we'll go back out to the Java 8 project, with that, which I haven't configured. And the way that you configure it basically is you just create a .env rc file. And so this is Java 8 project, and Matt comes with this nice utility for finding out what Java Home is for certain Java versions. So copy this, go and create an env rc file, export Java Home, that. Come back, and this is really the only step you have to do. You have to allow that EMVRC file to work in that directory. And now you can see that we're running Java version 1.8 with Maven 3.2. And this is a free tool. Uh, it's MIT license. Um, pull it down from this guy's GitHub, and you can install it from source, or there's some binary packages up there as well. So that's it. That's all I have. Thank 
you, Chris. So our next speaker is Lisa Lee and then Reba Anna. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, if, you've been to, uh, if you went to the earlier talks on the LEAP project, you probably heard of it because I shamelessly promoting my session for quite a, two days now. Um, so uh, this is my talk. Okay. All right. Yes, okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is to call for a community vote. Actually, you are doing most of the work. I'm not doing anything, I just talk. Um, so it's through the past year and a couple of years, I've been collecting a lot of uh, community requests on the features they want to improve in lessons and also new functionalities. So we have uh, the current version is uh, two point uh, uh, Sakai 10, and then in the middle you can see it's a uh, Sakai 11. This is what we are working on right now. So what would be the future? So what are we going? Uh, I try to wrap my head around those uh, so many requested features. So this is my personal way. I try to understand it. You know uh, how we uh, sift through all those requests and understand where we're going. Uh, now, so this is what you need to do. Um, I give you a multiple choice question. Don't worry, it's not a quiz. There's no correct or wrong answers. It's just which one you want to pick, okay? Um, so if you have this question, what do you want your lessons to be? It's a collection of lecture notes and instructions, or it is a central hub um, guiding people through all those learning materials, quizzes, uh, forums, or assignments, or eventually you are gonna get a um, adaptive learning path. You can track student progress, you want them to um, know where they are. Or um, you have one more choice, all of the above. Okay, so how many of you use lessons right here? Okay, quite some of you. Okay, uh, in the last vote in the LEAP project uh, session, um, most of the people voted D, all of the above. Uh, so I want you to uh, go to one page uh, to conduct a community vote. This page, uh, this link actually, uh, is on the tricider.com. This is the first time I'm trying this and see if it works. I um, uploaded the link on the uh, Lanyard page and I also tweeted uh, just a couple minutes earlier. If you could, could go to the Lanyard page, let me see, if, uh, where's my mouse? Okay, if you go to the Lanyard page, look under the Latining talks, I put the link here. All right, so if you click, you go to this page. Oh, what's happening with this web browser? Yeah, we've been having problem all day, huh? Okay, so you're getting this page. Uh, I have this is three category here. All right, oh, someone already voted. Thank you so much. And that would be Adeline. All right, is Adeline here? but thank you for support. Um, you can vote for each category. You can also vote on each of the features you like. Just click on this point here. And then below here, you can also add comments. What do you want to do? All right. I think this is basically my talk. Am I having one more minute? One minute, very good. So I hope that uh, this is uh, the survey that explained itself, so I don't need to give you more instructions. Um, I'm having it open for another 20 days until the end of the month. I'm also gonna post it on the Sakai user server. So I want to collect more information so eventually we could possibly have a phase two. Then everybody need to donate $1 for this project. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think this is supposed to work for me. Yeah. Do we have a Julian Kenny? OK. 
Okay, you're next. Next is Reba Anna. I, I think I got it. Does that work? I think so. Is that not working? Well, not my. Is that my. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm just here to show you the certification tool um, that we've started to use with our workshops. And of course, my screen is just going to be like everyone else's, and it's going to be a little crazy. But um, this is the first part I want to show you. So the certification, certification tool is, ugh. I'm a little bit more verbal, so I'll be like, I'm going to try not to curse. Um, <laughs> so basically it's um, a tool that we just started using for our faculty development workshops and basically what you do is um, I think it's a contrib tool but you can add it as manually to a site and you put in a fillable PDF and as an instructor there might be a little bit of a delay here Come on, work with me. Oh. Don't worry, I have five minutes. This is all like two seconds worth of information. So when you are viewing it as an instructor, you see the name of the certificate, you see what assignment they have to complete to um, get the certificate, and then you have what's called view report. And when you click on the view report, you will see nothing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, this is a little bit tricky, but I, I'll get it. Don't don't panic, anyone. Everything is under control, <laughs> except that I. Oh, there we go. Just so when you click on, oh, unbelievable. When you click on it, you go to. Hold on, let me move my mouse. I'm hand-to-eye coordination is really bad, but I can do this. So when you click on certification, you go in, then you go down here to view report. You're going to get a view of all the students who completed the assignment and their status. And you see the numbers in red? That tells me that they did not achieve the level needed to receive their certificate. So um, the students in red here did not receive it. The ones who received the certificate, there's a date, and that's the date that they passed the assignment, the assessment, or whatever um, course grade that they needed to get, whatever you put in there. And um, it says yes, and so that tells me, yes, they can get the certificate now. Now, when I go in as a student, I'm gonna be kind of tricky here with, with my different s screens. So that's what I see as an instructor. As a student, when I go in, I see something a little bit different. I clicked on the certificate tool. It tells me, hey, you have completed the requirements for the certificate, and you can go ahead and print it. So if I click on this, they get a PDF of the certificate, and we really haven't worked on the certificate part, so it's not beautiful yet but it's, it, it's you know, usable. It will put their name and the date that they completed it, and you can add other information too, that's just the things that we've added, and they can print this out. Now the step that we've added that I'm not gonna show you today is that once I go to that first screen and I see all the yeses, I send out an email to them saying, yes, hey, you received your certificate, but here's a link to a badge that goes with the certificate. So they get a certificate and a badge, and we're, you're, we're using Credly for badges, and then I give them the link so they can go and get their badge. So they can print it out, plus they have a digital badge, and then they're happy, and they come back for another workshop. So that's how we use the certificate tool. The end. Okay, our next speaker is Julian Tinney, and is there a Zuzana Molarova? Okay, he'll be next. 
Um, good afternoon. My name's Julian. I'm from the Xerti Project. Um, we've got a short film to show you this afternoon, which just introduces you guys to the project um, and, and there's some sort of key messages about our philosophy and what we're, what we're all about. So it's a really easy presentation for me to do. Thanks very much. The Xerti Project and the story so far. About 12 years ago, maybe a bit earlier, a brilliant guy named Julian Tenney gave up his lucrative job in the commercial sector and went to work for the University of Nottingham. Julian began some developments that would help him and his team develop Flash-based learning content more quickly. At the time, Flash was the best solution for delivering interactive online content, but the team were looking for a tool that worked much more like the flow line metaphor used in Macromedia Awfulware, an expensive but powerful tool which had been widely used in the team up until that time. Julian developed an engine that used an XML file to define the structure of an interactive project and an interpreter to execute code and create interactivity. At the time it took many hours to develop just an hour's worth of effective learning content, so work began on a visual editor for the XML files, which meant projects could be developed much faster and Julian's team began using the tools for a number of in-house projects. Over time, new features were added, and Julian then presented the work at Alt-C in 2006, when the tools were first released under a free license in the hope that others might find them interesting or useful. The name Xerti was adopted, an acronym for XML Editor and Runtime Engine. It seems there are references to suggest that Xerti also means joyful, or to know in Greek. And regular Xerti users certainly know how joyful it can be to use, especially in comparison to some other tools. The first Xerti community workshop was held at the University of Nottingham in June 2007, and shortly after the university began working with Gistech Dis and myself to begin to build a new layer of the tools that hid the technical authoring environment from users and allowed content to be developed using simple forms. The approach also made it very easy for developers to create new tools for offering new types of content and before long the software included nearly 30 templates for presenting different types of media and interactivity. GIST TechDIS and the GIST Regional Support Centres began actively promoting the tools. In January 2008, the team began a project known tentatively as Web-based Xerti and the development of Xerti Online Toolkits began. Web2 technologies made it possible to do things that would have been very difficult just a few years beforehand. The key objective was to hide all the technical complexities from users, who could then develop content just via a web browser, and collaborate on projects with other authors including subject matter experts and media specialists. Thanks to Julian, Pat Lockley, Faye Cross and others within the team at Nottingham, in July 2008, the Xerti Project suite of tools were released for the first time under an open source license and made available to the wider community of users and developers. Before the end of 2009, the team received their first taste of recognition after being shortlisted for the Times Education Awards. Just Tech This opened the Xerti Sandpit, providing a place for potential users to learn about and try the software, and the first version of Xerti Online Toolkits was demonstrated at Alt-C in Leeds, where the team also won the Alt Team of the Year Award. Xerti Online Toolkits was also made available to staff and students at the University of Nottingham for the first time, and take-up was rapid. The launch of Xerti Online Toolkits was a huge success. The user and developer communities began to grow very quickly. New external developers joined the community and began to contribute significant pieces of work. JISC funded the Zenith project, a small rapid innovation project that aimed to replace the existing Flash-based runtime with a runtime entirely developed in HTML5. This allowed content to be delivered to devices that didn't support the Flash player and allowed developers to engage with the project through familiar technologies. At the AGM in 2012, all the new features, including the eagerly anticipated HTML5 playback, were previewed for the first time as well as an excellent myth-busting talk about accessibility from Alastair McNaught. Xerti Online Toolkits version 2 was released in April 2013, and several incremental releases have been made since then. Reaction to the HTML5-based runtime has been very positive, resulting in wider mobile compatibility, making it easier for developers to create new templates using familiar HTML, JavaScript and CSS technologies. 
2013 to 2014 saw continued community growth in the UK and worldwide, and during 2014, the main focus for the team has been the development of a HTML-based editor to replace the existing Flash-based tools, and to put the project on a more sustainable footing given the success of the tools and the growth of the wider developer community. The redevelopment of the editor is a significant piece of work which will allow authoring to be undertaken on devices that can't run the Flash Player, for example authoring rather than just consumption on iPads and other tablets, as well as many other benefits. In September 2014 the project was accepted for incubation with the Aperio Foundation. After looking closely at all the options, it became clear that transitioning stewardship of the project from the University of Nottingham to the Aperio Foundation was in everybody's interest. Progression for incubation has been rapid, and we expect to graduate as a fully-fledged Aperio project with the next release of Xerti Online Toolkits, hopefully by May 2015, and a big conference in Baltimore, USA. Aperio represents a fantastic opportunity for the project to grow into new user communities and attract new developers to the team. So what's the key points from this 30 story and why might this be relevant to you? Well firstly you now know what the name 30 stands for both technically and philosophically. You'll also note that from the very beginning the emphasis has been on ease of use for everyone and anyone yet still offering powerful features and flexibility for specialist developers. Accessibility has been a core focus from the very beginning and remains so and sharing, collaboration and community have been fostered and grown throughout. Going forward the Xerti project remains an initiative to provide high quality free software to educators all over the world and to build a global community of users and developers around our tools. The Xerti project continues to place free values above all else. Ease of use for non-technical content authors providing best-of-breed accessibility and nurturing a positive and friendly community of users and developers worldwide. Thank you. Okay. So our next presenter is Zuzanna and Matt Clare. I don't know if he wanted to present. Um, next I have Jeff Posh and Kyle Blythe. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Zuzana Mladová. I am here with the team around Unitime Project, who has recently uh, graduated from the Aparao incubation process. Uh, Unitime is a solution for academic course timetabling, student scheduling, examination timetabling, event management. Um, I'm going to talk about how a tool such as Unitime can help an institution with course timetabling, where it can lead. So just briefly, so that we're on the same page, what is course timetabling? It's assigning times and rooms to classes. So deciding when and where should the students meet for the lecture of course XY, for the lab of another course. Um, how can course timetabling with a tool like Unitime help an institution? Well, the first thought that we usually uh, see when we talk to someone uh, is that, okay, how much time will it save to the timetabling person? Well, that may be 10% FTE, maybe 20% FTE. On the other hand, you need somebody to manage the software. So it may not be the best way of thinking of the course timetabling tool. Let's see other ways where Timetabling, course timetabling with um, software can help you. It can um, take better care of students. It can minimize student conflicts. The students will be able to graduate in time. It is an issue, for example, in Indiana currently. They have passed a law that the university has to make it possible for the students to graduate in time. Um, it can help use limited resources more efficiently. So... Um, for example, you can save money if you don't have to build another building, if you don't have to equip another classroom. Uh, it can make the process more transparent and sustainable. Uh, if you put the knowledge from the head of the timetabling people into the software, or at least most of it, um, 
Someone else can look at what led to the timetable. So a dean can look at it. Uh, if there is a problem with the timetable, it's easier to see where the problem comes from. Sustainability is in terms of keeping the knowledge of that person who does timetabling. So um, when timetabling is done manually, it is a headache when the person leaves. So um, a software can help you keep some of that information what led to a course timetable. You don't just have the timetable, you also have the information about how it was created. Um, it may help you improve fairness and satisfaction with the timetable. Fairness in terms of usually unfair times. You can split it, you can do it across departments so that one department doesn't choose all the 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. times so that all have their share of 7.30 or later in the evening. The same with instructors. You can be fair to instructors. You can have um, all of them taking their share of 7.30 times. Um, with such a tool, you can model what-if scenarios. You can model what happens. I want to renovate a building. Do I need to rent new classrooms? Do I need to negotiate with someone, with another college, uh, whether I can use their classrooms? Or if a school wants to change from semesters to trimesters, if they want to change curricula significantly, you can model all this. It's easier to adapt to changes. In many schools we see that they uh, take their last year's timetable uh, pull it to this year and make slight modifications. Maybe someone has left, so the new person teaches and they are not available at the time. Or there is a new course. But these are small modifications. What happens if you have significant change of curricula? Or if you lose a building? Um, so you can create a new timetable from scratch. Uh, or you can adjust the timetable when there is a change after course timetable has been published. You can, for example, a room becomes unavailable, so you can create a timetable that's as close to the published one as possible. You just take care of these few things. The software can support you in that. And those have been all the reasons I wanted to suggest that where a course timetabling with a tool like Unitime could help you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jeff Posh and Kyle Blythe, and then that would conclude our lightning talks. Thank Great. you. Great. Ready? Go. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Posh from NYU. Uh, we're going to talk about a new tool that's going to be in Sakai 11. It's called the Public Announcements Tool. It's avail it'll be available in the Workman, sorry, the um, admin workspace. Um, so essentially at NYU, um, we had a situation where we wanted to let users know that the system was going to be down because um, we were doing some updates to the database. So we thought, wouldn't it be great to have a banner that appears at the top of the screen? Um, so, we, so we created a new tool, and I'll go to that interface now. You can see the banner at the top. So the interface is pretty straightforward. I'll go in to edit uh, the warning that I have up there now. So right now, this is, a, this is a medium warning, very straightforward. You just put in the text and then just set the severity. In this case, it's, it's a medium. So that means that users can dismiss this, um, but it'll just be hidden from them. So we thought it'd be nice to get it out of their way. Um, so if they want to see what that is again, they can click this. If you have multiple alerts, it'll say there's one more alert, two more alerts, et cetera. Then we started thinking, well, it might be nice you know, if a building blows up or something like that, um, that you want to let people know, hey, something, something is wrong on campus. Um, so we created, we created some different levels of severity. So, for example, you have a goat on campus that's, you know, giving you problems. You can put something like that up, and that's not dismissible at all. So if there's a, if there's a problem on campus, you can, you can throw that one up. We also thought it would be nice, and obviously these can could happen at the same time, but it's not likely that would, there would be that many going on at the same time. So I might just turn that one off. And then you can just have sort of a FYI um, low-level warning. 
So let's say your course sites are available to be created. And with all of these, you know, you can set, like I said, you can set, set the different level of severity, you can set the start time and the end time for these alerts, and you can even determine which servers that these will appear on. Okay, and I'll just save that one. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle and um, he'll talk about um, the pop-ups or alerts portion sure. of this. Absolutely. So in addition to having these banners along the top of the screen, we also wanted to be able to surface pop-ups that would appear when users log in to the system. Uh, and these pop-ups would be able to be temporarily dismissed or permanently dismissed. So if I go ahead and edit this one, uh, this is actually one that we used recently to send out a survey to faculty at the university. So we were able to upload the content for the survey, uh, choose the start time and end time, and we could choose to show it to either everyone or to selected users. So in our case, we actually pulled a list of all of our instructors and sent it to all the instructors. And the result, if I go ahead and log in here, once it logs in, oh, internet, you can do it. Wait, waiting, waiting. Ah, look at that. So we had a beautiful pop-up message here that I can choose to remind me later, at which point it would show up the, uh, the following day, or I can choose not to show it again. And this is, again, fully configurable through the admin workspace. That's all we got. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And so this, this also tracks, like, it'll track the people who said don't show again, and it'll also track the people who just said remind me later. So we had pretty good, pretty good response to it. So thanks. Look for it in Sakai 11. Everybody, and that concludes it. And I guess social events tonight, dine around. So if you want to attend, 5:30 at the lobby. Thanks.